country is under nuclear attack, so I think I'll just come to the presidential bunker, you know, for safekeeping. Mm. Maybe that wood door is not going to protect me. Hi, I'm Daphne Brogdon, and this is 24 Inside. And we are going to open up with an interview with executive producer Howard Gordon. Howard, you are the showrunner for 24. Now, for those of us who don't know that term, tell us what that means. You're running around or what? I'm running around. Now, uh, the showrunner, um, best way I could describe it is someone who takes all the credit and uh, accepts all the blame. <laughs> Basically. Well, you're a writer. I'm a writer, and uh, and really, I'm I'm in charge of the day to day creative direction of the show. So I supervise or work with the other writers to determine the creative direction okay. of the show, and um, ultimately, I'm responsible for for it, for the direction of the show. Um, the the trick to writing the show every year, year to year, is to figure out where Jack is located emotionally, mm. and. Since he's traveled such a distance emotionally, he's sort of lost about as much as any man could possibly lose. And uh, he'd been, and we knew he'd spent the last 18 months or so in China. Um, this guy's, the weight, the cumulative weight of all that he's suffered and all that he's lost, we knew was going to be sort of uh, an external scar and an internal scar. And so essentially we knew Jack had nothing to lose anymore. And in fact, the idea of dying would actually be a relief to a guy like Jack. Yeah, but it, it, but as it went along, he sort of yeah, he's armed with in. a yeah, and exactly. So the, the the sort of emotional trajectory of the season is giving Jack a reason to live. I mean, for me, every season of Twenty Four has a sweet spot where just everything is so right, working, and it was it was kind of really starting with the evil father thing. It really kicked in for me. Well, we've been trying to get that old evil father in for four years now. You're kidding. Every year we try to say, how can we get Jack's father and um, and his and his evil family to all our minds, and I think by by consent among all the writers that um, our, our idea was that Jack had had this very powerful family, you know, a father in particular who he'd fled from to pursue his own destiny, mm -hmm. that he had a brother, you know, so there's a little Hamlet, a little King Lear thrown in yeah. to, to borrow from some, you know, some really good sources. Just a little Shakespeare. Uh, um, and then when we, you know, then we retrofitted the uh, uh, Bluetooth guy. Well, that's what my question is. Did you know last year Bluetooth guy was going to no, be his brother? No idea, no. But it was one of those great questions at the end of the year. People said, so you, guys, you never answered who the Bluetooth guy was. And I enjoyed the fact that it was open-ended and that we didn't know who he was. But, but that question presented itself, the answer to that question presented itself in the room. And we said, who, you know, let's, we, we wanted Jack's brother. And somebody said, what if it's Bluetooth guy? Now, how, why was it this season fit to bring the evil family in? It was actually more measure of our desperation than any kind of concerted design on anybody's part. We just like, uh, we've been wanting to do this. Last year, Christopher Henderson at one point was going to be Jack's father, then was going to mm. be Jack's brother, mm. the guy Peter Weller yes. played. Yes, yeah, yeah, he was good. But so, instead, um, it became a mentor. We just couldn't get, couldn't, could never get to it, could never quite get to it. This year, we forced our way into it. And part of it, too, was the sort of heinousness of it, <clears throat> of last year. I mean, in a way to, to sort of, uh, to pin all of what happened last year and a lot of what was happening this year on on Jack's family to insinuate them into this drama really gave it this cumulative weight. They were responsible for David Palmer in some measure. They were responsible yeah. not only for the nuclear bomb today, but for all that had happened, for, for Michelle and for Tony and yeah. for even, they, they targeted Jack. I mean, I think we even trumped Tony Soprano, whose own mother tried to to kill her. Now Jack finds out that both his brother and his father had conspired to kill him. It was interesting. You said there was a lot of stuff in the season that that uh, Jack Bauer is not in, and I was thinking about that with all the the intrigue going on in the in the bunker and the uh, attempted assassination and so forth. And I thought, well, this is a huge story arc that Jack has no influence over. And I mm -hmm. thought, isn't that was a little um, unusual, wasn't it? Well. It's a little bit we, – we've done years where Jack didn't have a direct impact. He didn't have very much impact on the uh, David Palmer story the and first season. And his wife and everything. And his wife. I mean, they, yeah. get, they get to play those dramas out. It's sort of nice for these other stories to breathe and to evolve on their own without Jack have, uh, Jack's actions having to impact on them. Now, some of the side characters that was kind of fun this year that um, uh, James Morrison's character and Jane Atkinson, right. that they ended up – they're married. How did, was that something that was a, a seed planted from that last season? It was. I mean, they, they just had chemistry. They were good and independent of each other. I think I was on the set and I saw Jane and she and, and we talked about just uh, upstairs in the writer's room had talked about, you know, there's, there's something going on there. And Jane said, you know, I don't know if you've noticed, but there's kind of something going on between Bill and I <laughs> and uh, James and I. And uh, they just looked great together. And it was just a detail that, again, hasn't had a tremendous impact in terms right. of the story, but it's just a flavor. You interviewed both of them last season. They're both a lot more like kind of fun and frisky than their than characters. The characters. Oh, yeah. 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 
They well, that's can, why they're actors. Every year, there's always a little bit different CTU crowd. Is 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 there is that thought out? Sort of like, well, we need some new fresh blood, or oh, absolutely. And what's one of the great parts of the show is that we can really refresh the cast, mm-hmm. which is a euphemism sometimes for a cleaning I house, know, which it's is sad. really another uh, another they story. Die. It's good, but it's also hard because we've also exhausted so many archetypes, so many yeah. characters who kind of you know. Edgar will forever be Edgar. And he was very original. Of, he was original, and Chloe yeah. will forever be the idiosyncratic kind of mm-hmm. rain man-like woman. But you uh, gave her a little bit of a different bent this year. Well, I mean, yeah, she's grown up. I mean, one of the things, that, some of the complaints that some fans have had, uh, at least I've heard whispers of this, is that Chloe isn't Chloe anymore. She's not being as funny. She's not being funny, and, you know, I think that's a, and I understand that criticism or that observation mm-hmm. but the fact is this show has taken place over six years or so, even more maybe mm-hmm. in actual time and it would really be kind of silly yeah. and reductive and not even respecting the character to have Chloe just be the same stuck in a loop kind of quirky person she's grown up was there anything I remember the um, the one year where the, the, the female head of CTU had the crazy daughter uh-huh. and then the writers were like yeah the crazy daughter thing wasn't really working so we kind of killed the crazy daughter right. <laughs> you know, was there anything this season that you sort of started and then went uh, it's not going the way we wanted to there are things, for instance, like stories that don't need perfect resolution. For instance, Nadia, uh, because she's a Muslim American, has her rest- has her security mm-hmm. um, an, an extra layer of security added onto her, right. and it creates all sorts of d- it dynamics. It's like a, a pebble in a pond; right. it ripples out, but it doesn't really get resolved. It's actually brought back later in the series. Right. Because when you bring on a character like a Bill Buchanan, you don't know if it's going to be. A few episodes. Don't know. No. Or several seasons. No. Bill's one of those characters, though, who is like, the, um, he's like the captain of a ship. I mean, he's just is able to deliver this cumbersome, yeah, dialogue and find moments in the slenderest dramatic conceits that really he conveys authority, intelligence, wisdom. He's just been a real, real go-to character. Okay, now I got to ask you about big deaths here, Curtis. The Curtis, Curtis have to go. We loved Curtis. You know, again, this is one of those tragic things where, you know, we had, had we had struggled last year to find... Curtis had a great story in year four. Yeah. Last year, we struggled a little bit with finding something for him to do. Mm-hmm. And, you know, except for the guy who breaks down the door and, you know, is, is part Jack. of the... Supports Jack. Yeah. And um, so that was one thing that contributed to, to Curtis's demise. The other was that Jack, who, again, has come back wanting to die wanting to leave this thing, had to do something so loathsome. And then the only thing that's going to bring him back, the only thing big enough to, to one thing, to have him leave, and then to bring him back is, of course, a, the detonation of a nuclear bomb. So big things. Everyone is yeah. forced to this very extreme, desperate place. Are you worried about certain patterns emerging? Like, we have a lot of dead presidents now. <laughs> I mean, right. So you're like, oh, man. Well, technically, we've only killed one ex-president. We've tried to kill a couple of presidents. Well, I know, but, you know, once you're a president, you're always a president. So That's we right. got David Palmer. There was a president who died in Air Force One. He did die. He is convalescing in a home in Maryland. He is? He was just... He never died on, on screen. In fact, that was a... No, um, we intended to kill him, but, but Fox... Um, in fact, that was the only time we have had a corporate mandate from somewhere up on high. Don't kill the said, don't kill, president. Don't, and I don't... I think part of it was the that it was distasteful that Air Force One was targeted and successfully. And then Logan, I thought Logan was dead, but maybe he's not. He, I, he's no, he. I think he. I didn't see him. He was in the ambulance. They I said didn't he's, see him buried until he's buried. Okay. You're not dead on twenty four. <laughs> you can <laughs> flatline. Okay. Now I didn't see Assad buried, and I was sorry to see him go. He's dead. Trust me, I saw he, he wasn't moving. That was a really good character, though. That character really represents to me, you know, to the extent that we're a political show and we're really not, we just try to tell a good story. Yeah. But that character represented to me probably the most unrealistic character of all of them. Mm-hmm. But the idea that there would be somebody who was kind of a, a hybrid of... Osama bin Laden and Osama Gandhi. Bin Laden, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yasser Arafat, Gandhi, Zawahari, right. and Gaddafi. If they all had a child together, it would probably be Assad. Yeah. And, um, Except it was really good looking child. He's a very good looking child. <laughs> Did you think about not killing him? Yeah, he actually had a movie, so it worked out well. Oh, and okay. it also, once again, it fed pretty well the idea that um, this character that we introduced then uh, of the vice president, Noah Daniels' point of view, to use him as a patsy. You know, sometimes when these things suggest a story idea, 
uh, they're irresistible, and, and people, sac- characters have to get sacrificed for a really good story idea. Now, somebody who's really seems to bring a lot to the table is Peter McNichol. He has probably, and Kiefer, I would say the same thing about, has such a deep understanding of his character, and, mm-hmm. and in many ways deeper even than the writers, mm-hmm. than any of us. He lives and knows intimately what his character says, and so he, he'll add some grace notes uh, you mean wife, dialogue? Dialogue, and, and which, which, are, which is very nuanced, but that which is so, uh, just demonstrates how keenly aware he is of how nuanced his character is. Last night, there was something and my wife turned to me and said, that's a great line, did you write it? I said, no, that was Peter McNichol. Um, I don't remember which one it was. Yeah, and then I love Powers Booth as the vice president. That was great casting. Great. We've always loved Powers. Powers is one of those guys who we've talked about for four years getting on the show. No kidding. Finally had a, a role for him. Is there somebody else who's been on the show that you had been wanting to get on for a long time? Regina King is someone we've been a fan of. I mean, certainly um, James um, Cromwell is somebody who we've always admired. Right. I think what's interesting and great about the show is that the people who are fans of the show are often, you know, I think it's a lot of actors' favorite show. Mm-hmm. So people are always coming up to Kiefer and saying, hey, man, I want to do a, you know, he's promised a couple of people parts. Oh. Yes, <laughs> Is there uh, something that you guys haven't tried on the show yet that, that you want to, but you're like, oh, I don't know, is it too much out of our particular genre? I have to say we've tried every... We, we've Maybe tried. leaving L.A.? Well, leaving L.A. is something that we've talked about, and for, mostly for production reasons. Um, we haven't done it. I mean, we just barely finished one season when we have to start prepping the next season. So you're looking yeah. at, at guys who've run not just one marathon, but sort of yeah. six continuous marathons. However, I will say this year, the thought is to take it out of L.A., whether we actually succeed in doing it. I mean, not actually, but but setting it somewhere else, or at least setting part of the story. Because poor L.A.'s really abroad. been beaten up. L.A.'s been really beaten this up. This is the valley. <laughs> I think our location people are saying, I've shot every inch of this city. I yeah. can't, you know, so they're running out of steam and running out of, you know, places to shoot. So we've got to, you know, mix it up a little bit. I think this year, meaning the seventh year, we'll do that. Any other things you think for the next season? Uh, We're just debating the very end of 24, which will probably impact what we do next year. But we just need a couple days off, and then we'll we'll reconvene and start arguing about where to start next year. But we have no idea. i got to ask you about Gurdanko's severed arm, because Mm. I cannot figure out why he went through getting it cut off when he gave up um, uh, Fayed in that bar. He was self-interested. I mean, he says himself, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a soldier. I'm a soldier, not, not, a, not, a, not a martyr. Right. So I always thought, why did he go through the whole arm chop? He wants to survive. And, he, and he's happy to, he uses uh, Fayed when, they, when he's cornered. He's like, let this guy be the distraction so I can slip out the back door. Right. And now, then he dies like a, a, a dog. You so know, he did die. The, well, he, yeah, down by the, uh, did you see the, I mean... Are, no, I know, under the pier, yeah, but the I'm pier. just saying... Yeah, no, he's dead. He's, he's right. dead. Okay, he's, he's dead. dead. I almost need a scorecard. Who's really who's dead? dead and who's who's not coming back? Now, you've got some other shows in the hopper. Mm-hmm. We have a, a one that's right now called uh, Company Man, which is about um, um, a, 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 an innocent guy who works for a Halliburton type of organization oh, that is nice. a little bit like the the firm that who has their tentacles and do some of these ideas come to you with, with working on 24 you're like oh you know it'd be interesting if you had this other storyline that don't fit uh-huh. within the parameters yeah, yeah yeah now one last thing about the, the the politics of the show because it is interesting when you watch it sometimes you're like well this is a very politically conservative angle coming here and then you're like oh no now they're talking aclu that's kind of a leftist one is that on purpose that you try to sort of balance those things out there's no willful balancing it's not a tit for tat we don't keep a, 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 a debit and credit sheet in terms of Oh, this is a, this will this will please the Because there are very interesting debates well, because, that go on. Well, because there are really interesting debates in the world that mm-hmm. go on, and so for the same reason, there there are interesting debates that go on in our fictional world. And to the extent that we've been co-opted by by both sides of the aisle, the fact that Rush Limbaugh and Barbara Streisand are both you know huge fans tells you that it's kind of a politically a Rorschach test. I mean, yeah, yeah, but we don't keep track, and we subvert everything again uh, to the story. If it's a good story, we'll take it. It's a good story. Beat them up or save them. Who cares? <laughs> Thank you so You're much. Welcome. This is very interesting. So this is a first for me. The first time I've ever interviewed a casting director. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. So you have been doing the casting from the very beginning for 24. Since right? the very beginning, since the pilot. So when they they give you the script and you know those first few seasons, kind of putting together the regular characters, what kind of direction were you given? Less than you would think. 
<laughs> it's kind of divided up into the storylines. We have the people in the CTU, we have the people in the White House story or the government story, and then the group of whatever terrorists that we have that year. And there's a blueprint that they give us in the beginning, but oh, the yeah. characters are not drawn so finely that that we had to sort of fit the round you know, round peg into the square hole. We're given a great deal of freedom in terms of the, the kinds of people and the types and sizes and ages and race, um, especially in the CTU. Uh, they maybe would break down like the technical person or the person who's going to go out into the field. So we start coming up with names, we start bringing faces to the producers, and, uh, you know, they begin to tell us, and they find for themselves somehow, you know, how the characters will be fleshed out a little bit more. And also in the beginning, the story, they don't know what it's going to track to be for the entire season. So right. we are left to try to give them actors who could fulfill, you know, any number of scenarios. My favorite example, the best example, was in the second season when we were putting together The Young Family and the girl who we cast uh, to play the young wife, Marie. We knew only that she was going to have a turn and that she was mm. somehow going to turn out to be bad. In terms of bringing the girls in, we didn't tell anyone yeah. that they were going to eventually end up being bad. We just looked for someone that we knew might be able to give them a great turn. So when you were given the blueprint for a set character like Tony Almeida, you know, did, did they, so they say, mm. like, okay, he's going to be a determined guy, but kind of emotional, and, you know, or how... I hate to say that it wasn't as planned out as all yeah. that, but in, in the pilot, and he was smart, he was good at his job, he had Jack's back, but beyond that, just what was on the page, I don't think they even envisioned how far that character would go. Are there characters um, that you have cast that then you were sorry that when they did meet their demise? Oh, all, all the time. I, I'm always charging up to the office and saying, oh, my God, do we really have to kill George Mason? Do we really have to kill Assad? I mean, I have a large bulletin board full of actors' pictures who I can't use again. And Aww. I always tease, tease them and say, you know, if we didn't see them take their last breath, maybe we could have them back. I'm still wondering where Beirut is. <laughs> you know, we always joke that we're going to have an entire episode or maybe even an entire season full of the people that we we're not sure exactly where they went, <laughs> if they died, if they're alive, if they're stranded on a highway somewhere with no gas. What's the audition process again, 24? Just a couple of scenes i got to memorize, or how does it work? Sometimes we have very little to go on. Um, there was an episode at the beginning of last season where we ha had a large group of terrorists in the airport, and at the very end of the script, there was, uh, it said, the man with the yellow tie. Now, it makes me nervous when they have a character that doesn't have a name, but mm. he was delivering a very important piece of information. So we've learned to have this, this radar that goes off, and we'll read the script and say, hmm, well, that guy's going to come back again. So we go up to the offices and say, who is this man with the yellow tie? What's he going to do? And then sometimes they'll spill out the fact that, oh, yes, well, he's, he's going to be in five or six episodes, mm. and he's a major terrorist, and here he has this great plan, so we need somebody really terrific. And the actors obviously don't have anything to read, per se, for the role. Oh. It's something that's being developed and, and written as, they, as we speak. So we'll take sometimes material from another piece and just ask them to take a look at an, a terrorist from another season. Um, usually there's something a little bit more than that to go on. We'll, we'll just read a scene. So you're looking just for a range of acting talent, then, of, of ability. Right. We usually tend to overcast the roles a little bit because we don't know for sure. Meaning what that if that it's mean? somebody... I would never believe that somebody was just one line on our show. I mean, people have had one scene and it's turned into five years. Um, people have, you know, had stays of execution. Peter Weller, I'm sure, would have died several episodes earlier had he not gone up to the smoke room and talked about how his character could go on. So, <laughs> so did that really happen? Yes. I, I, can, I can confirm it. You oh, can call and ask him yourself. <laughs> We always want to get the best actor for the role, whether it's one word or a thousand words, mm -hmm. but here in particular because they look to us to make sure that we're covering them in a way that if they want to have that guy who had one scene in the airport go on and he's going to have later three scenes with Kiefer and he's going to go out into the field. So we always want to get actors that, you know, they bring their, you know, they bring game. I would say at least 50% of the time it works out that they do end up with, you know, a lot more than they had at first. You don't need to name any names, but are there people who you've cast for a part and then you've gone... Uh, that wasn't quite hidden in it. Yes. I mean, there are times, too, sometimes the writers, like I said, they don't know what's coming down the pike and will have cast something not, you know, just like they didn't know, we didn't either. And But there have been a couple circumstances where, you know, I should have, could have, would have. <laughs> but sometimes, you know, the casting that we do will somehow help them inform the characters that they're writing, too. One of my favorite little minor characters that just keeps on trucking, Agent Burke. Know. You know, know, he gets only one line, but it's like, you know, when Agent Burke's called, like, uh-oh. <laughs> For Chloe, did they say, okay, we want to cast, like, a quirky 
character person? There was a quirky, sort of odd character in the CTU. She didn't have very many lines at all. And uh, once Mary Lynn's name came up, that, that was it. And they just wrote for her. They loved her. That's great. So for your job, are you watching a lot of different shows to, to scout for talent? Well, that's part of the job. Lots of movies, <laughs> lots of television. You have to keep your eye out there. So is there anybody who was on 24 that you feel like, hey, they kind of got their start here? I don't know if we can take credit for discovering anyone necessarily, yeah. but I think that 24 gives people legs and maybe gives people, you know, sort of a second wind. I mean, Dennis Haysbert certainly had a, a huge career of his own before he came to yeah. us, but now he's got his own series on, a, on another it's network playing the lead. So you know, it, it's good. There's, there's good visibility. Do you, do you cast for the sort of stunt casting, for lack of a better word, sort of the, the different characters, the big names differently than you do for the you regulars? Know, I would say up until the last year or so, we have studiously avoided that. Mm. Um, I think that the world that we created, I think it takes you takes you out of our world. And Jack Bauer is saving the world, and all of a sudden there's, you know, Susan Sarandon, what's she doing in the CTU? So right. I think that this year there have been maybe more recognizable faces than in the yeah, past, but even so, not like huge star marquee names, you know, actors that are familiar faces, and we like to say, Oh, I know that actor from somewhere, but yeah. not necessarily somebody who's going to take you out of the moment. Well, thank you so much for talking to us. Thanks.